Hello, everyone. I am here with Adam Kalibjian, a famous music editor who's worked on games such as Destiny 2, Ghost of Tsushima, God of War Ragnarok, Death Stranding, and more. A very impressive background, and I'm so happy to have you on for the show today. Thanks for having me, Noah. Happy to be here. So my first question is, so you're known as a very well-talented music editor. Could you tell the audience what that specifically means? How does it differ from, say, being a sound composer, an audio programmer, such and such and such? Totally, yeah. I think it's, you yeah, know, it's a great question because it's sort of a niche thing that I feel like, at least in the film world, is a little bit more well understood that the relationship between a music editor and a composer. Um, the music editor it would be in a more traditional sense, sort of this um, liaison between the composer and director or the studio okay. and a composer, you know, sort of helping with, you know, picture cuts and 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 being it sort of what we would call it a dub, which is basically where all the, the sort of creative stakeholders would be in sort of the final mix and balancing all the levels of, you know, dialogue versus the sound effects versus the music and the sort of music representation. But in games, it's a completely different thing. It's and and the and the role of music editor is sort of being redefined now, in the sort of the 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 sphere of, of gaming. They're sort of we're starting to see it be called music designer. Some people still call it music editor. Um, but a lot of the duties are similar. Where it's it it's a similar liaison role, but there's a more nuance to the actual work that gets done because, for a video game like some of the games that you know that you mentioned that I've have had you know the absolute you know fortune and um uh, you know I'm Alan? very thankful to to work on some of those awesome games yeah um like the the the, the role is we still have composer right the composer right. gets hired for these games um but they're not writing to picture in a linear fashion, the same way that a composer would be on a film. Right. There, there's sort of this in-between process of like, well, how, how does the composer get the direction and understand what actually is going to be needed to write the music for this video game? Especially when you're dealing with these larger video games that can be 20, 30 hours long. There's no way a composer is going to write 20 or 30 hours of music for a multitude of reasons. One is money. Like that's the most obvious. Right. Like there's just no Especially with like how Destiny has like these live orchestral recordings, which mm -hmm. are very costly. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. I mean, we, we have the fortune of, of, of recording our, a lot of our, if not all of our orchestral stuff um, live at a very, at, at a variety of different uh, venues and studios. And, you know, you pile that, up with the actual cost of paying the composer with the costs of production and maintaining the product and the labor it's like this is, this is there's so from so you look at the sort of the hard numbers like it doesn't make sense to it, you can't have a composer for a game right 20 hours of music to cover your 20 hour game right and so what you end up with is the sort of someone like a music editor or a music designer that's sort of the in between of helping you know, maybe they have a better understanding of the game and sort of guiding and crafting a little bit of the briefs of like, well, what's the music we actually need written for the composer? A great example of this was like um, on the first major game that I worked on, which was uh, Call of Duty Modern Warfare in 2019 or 2018. I think it was 2019, whatever the sort of the first rebooted. Yeah, the, the new series, the first in the new series of the Modern Warfare trilogy. Yeah. The new um, trilogy. Yeah, we had like, I think around two and a half hours of music written for that. Um, but they were sort of like in suite format. And this is a common thing that they'll do, like they'll do in games is like, sort of like more kind of broad show, like, hey, this area of the game might need like some kind of action music, this might need some stealth music. And music editor will help coordinate sort of the feedback and the sort of guidance a bit with like a music director or music supervisor. Um which would be sort of those would be people that are kind of in more like sort of high leadership positions, maybe at a game company or, um, you know, at a studio. Okay. And they would help be coordinating with the composer and sort of the feedback and just making sure this thing can get what we need. So then when the composer actually writes that music and delivers it, they'll deliver it all stemmed out, which is basically where they'll print um, individual audio tracks of each instrument sort of type. So like, brass and strings oh, no, and, it's, synths uh, and percussion it's in, i'm sure you probably know this but it's like the same in film like yeah you submit for a film you have, you submit in stems 
totally so that process is the same as films is the whole the whole stem submission but where it starts to differentiate is the composer has not really written that piece of music to say a particular linear piece unless it's for like a cutscene or something in the game which right. there are those too like composers will write specific music for the cutscenes that's treated a little bit more like standard film but all that other stuff like these suites or these kind of these more broad stroke things the stems get will get delivered to someone like a music designer or a music editor and they will then sort of assemble the assets that will actually go in the game out of those stems and that it can get very extensive in terms of and the creative liberty taken, depending on the team and the project that you're working on, it can get very extensive, the amount of editing that's done with those stems, you know, muting stuff, moving things around, time stretching, pitch shifting, um, supplemental right. stuff, putting cues together that didn't exist before. If you saw the, the game sound contact where I talked about sort of like hybridization, where we take existing Destiny music with new Destiny music or older cues that never existed together and sort of right. smash them and create this new cohesive musical experience it's sort of that's sort of the like the crux of where a lot of the music editor work for games happens because okay. that's how you cover i mean that's this work and this work is being more recognized now is by someone that's more of a specialist in music but i think a lot of times in the past this would either be handled on indie games this a lot of times is handled also by the composer um, just right. because, again, of budgetary reasons, you don't really have the budget to hire an entire music team. The composer is sort of the one-stop shop for everything music. Um, or actually, in the past, yeah. it would be a sound designer sometimes. Right. So and that actually happens. leads uh, pretty com pretty smoothly into my next question. How much of the implementation part of the gaming process do you personally handle? Like, do you use middleware like Wise or FMOD? Uh, do you do any audio programming? Or yeah. is that another? That's all you? Well, so yeah, also also a great question. Um, yeah, I've got a lot of wise experience, um, which I've learned basically on the job. I I never really had much exposure to wise going into this industry. Um, wise is kind of one of those weird things you can learn, and I suggest folks learn the fundamentals of wise. You know, take the wise certification courses, or just watch a bunch of YouTube videos. That'll give you a good basic understanding of wise. Um, most AAA games use Wise if they're using middleware. Um, I have not had much experience with FMOD. It, I, 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 my understanding is that it's got a lower barrier to entry, it, and it's it does, like, free, and you can just kind of plug it in, and it's, you know, it's a little bit less AAA. It, it's it is more approachable to entry. I have found in my education that Wise is better personally in the long run when you get used to things, but FMOD is great. Bear, and no shade to FMOD, like there have been great games. Oh, totally, yeah. That, oh, sound award-winning game. Celeste is the first that comes to mind. That mm -hmm. used FMOD, but totally is my middleware of choice. Totally. Um, the thing that the thing that Wise is really hard to beat is that it it is it's everything in one program, right? You you can manage your your sound design, your music, you can mix, you can do everything in Wise. Right, you in can a, even work with other people. I've worked on a sound team yeah. on a project where. You know, we each have our own banks, and then totally overwrap, over overwrite each other. That's how, mo and that's how a lot of the larger games are. When you've got a large team, Wise has good integration with Perforce, which is a version control software um, that a lot of game companies use as well. Um, you know, for exactly for what you're saying, so that multiple people can be working in a project at the same time. But yeah, I mean, to answer your question, yeah, I use I use Wise a lot, and um, didn't ha I mean didn't have much experience with it going in, but sort of learned as, as I was going. And it's one of those things that it's really good to learn the fundamentals, but each team and each project with like, you know, even at one game company, if there are different teams and different projects, they all use wise a little differently. And so right. there's really no standardization in terms of like, how should I use wise for my game? It's kind of like up to you. It's like, you can, you can use the interactive music hierarchy, which is the the music portion of Wise, in a variety of ways. And there are states and switches. Do I use states? Do I use switches? Kind of up to you based on the needs of the game. And it's sort of like, there are all these like nuances. And, and if you ask anybody, like there's not one glove that fits all in terms of like, okay, if I learn these things, this will get me prepared to work on any game that uses Wise. Because it's very team-centric and, and each team's workflow is different. 
But that said, it's like learning a DAW. It's like learning logic versus Cubase versus Pro right. Tools. Or any actually, of sorry, that just you know? goes into my next question. Oh, perfect. DAW of choice. I was really curious. Yeah. I mean, for me, being sort of a lot of audio editing, I use Pro Tools almost on a daily basis for my job. Composition or anything MIDI related, I use Cubase. Um, and I'm still learning Cubase. I was a logic logic dude and 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 i'm sort of i've transitioned to cubase and it's definitely got a bit of a sort of higher barrier of entry and a little bit of a steeper yeah. learning curve but it does a lot of really cool things with automation and, and laning lanes and pretty intuitive ways of printing stuff and it, it looks clean and the more recent updates have been pretty good and i like the way it handles the mix mix structure and, and vsts more than logic but yeah. like you know all of these things it's like all the, the all of the methods and the um the the philosophies and everything are all the same it's just a matter of where are the buttons and what do they call them and so it's the same for wise it's like you learn this if you can learn sort of the the, the logistics and the philosophy of like how to, how to, how does music work for a game it just becomes more a matter of like oh where's the button for me to do the thing i want to do rather yeah. than kind of looking at it and being like oh i don't know what's going on you know yeah. And it's the same it's the same for dawes like like yeah like well, yeah so and um as for, and the last step of implementation audio programming I, as mm, yeah. you know, there's middleware and then there's the code that reads the middleware do you yeah. handle that or do you let a is there a team or a person for that yeah it depends again on the project like call of duty was an example where i was basically the only implementation person on that game and so i was really? also doing the scripting but it wasn't programming um because programming is a I would say they're different. They're very different jobs. Like someone that wants to be an audio programmer usually comes from a computer science background with, with an interest in audio. Oh. And it's, it's, it's kind of one of those things that like, if you, if you're interested in audio, like I think way back in the day, probably 20 or 30 years ago, it was, it was much easier to be sort of these things all together because the technology was a lot more limited and a little bit more rudimentary. So it's like audio programming meant something different than it means now, which is like, if you're an audio programmer now, you probably know C sharp and C and like all the like these coding languages, and you're probably spending more of your time developing tools and improving workflows and efficiencies for an audio team rather than actually working on content. Okay. That's been my experience. And so they're very there's like audio, if you want to be an audio programmer, that's its like own job category. And you could you could double down on that. And audio programmers are very desirable or very desired um heads because um they have a very i mean they're, they're they're very skilled and crafted at the co at coding and programming that is very transferable to a lot of other tangential tech industries like that's the thing about being an audio programmer is that they're they're programmers that have a specific interest in audio and so if you're someone like that you could go work at meta you could go work at amazon you could go work at a lot of these different companies but it's like these people have a specific interest in games and audio. So that's those, those are how you, you kind of break into the audio programming for games. Um, and those jobs pay, tend to pay pretty well because engineers and programmers tend to get paid very well. Um, and do. not as many people are going for those as, as the sort of the, the, the creative or more content related things, which is a become a much more sort of competitive um industry like myself i don't consider myself a programmer like i don't know like coding languages and i really don't have much desire to like the farthest i got was the scripting and lewis like the lewis scripting stuff um which and some visual scripting and stuff like that which is that's about where my limit is in terms of what i can handle um because it's also just not my desired area of like expertise because it, it's its own it's like it's its total totally own area hope that answers your uh, question i know like what you said mostly reflects my own experience i I always usually, cause I, you know, I know little, I know wise solidly well. I make, I can make a dynamic music system that changes based on the state of the player, but I can't program or co or script that into the game. I've always needed help on that end. So yeah. I very much relate. Totally. And, and it's honestly, I mean, on these large games, it's kind of the preferred way because you know, then a lot of like some, like, there's like some collaboration that comes out of that. And it's also kind of like, and then everybody kind of gets to do what they're best at and what they want to stay focused on. It's like if you're working with a really good audio programmer or a designer or an engineer that really enjoys that kind of work, they get to like really shine and 
they can do their job the best. And it's like, if someone's not as good at that job or like as deep into the weeds, it's sort of kind of detracts from the whole, like, well, what are we trying to get here out of the end product? We, we want everybody to sort of be doing the thing that they're best at and what they want to be doing. And so on these, on these larger games and these larger companies where you have these larger teams, it kind of like leads to a lot of these more nice sort of natural handshakes and handoffs between like, okay, I can do my wise work and then they can do their scripting or their programming work. And everybody's sort of in their field that they are comfortable with and that they end right. what's going to end up with the best result at the end. Right. Sounds like good team synergy. That's the goal. Yeah. So I think that's the bulk of my technical questions. Now I have some questions about just your own personal history and design process. So yeah. um, now one thing is I'd like to know is what was it like getting started at Bungie or Blit or Activision Blizzard? Like how was getting in the industry? What was that like? It was a surprise to me. And like it kind of it was a little bit blindsiding because so I graduated college five years ago with a film scoring degree from Berkeley College of Music in Boston. And I thought, and I had moved and I, I had planned to move to LA. A lot of my friends were doing the same thing, but I had planned to work in the film and TV industry as a composer's assistant. That's basically where my mindset was at. And then I had met an alum of the school that was working for a music team in-house music team for PlayStation, which has a pretty large music team. And they also post internships. I don't know when they go live, but um, I always recommend people to always keep their eyes out for their internships because they do post them every now and then. Okay. Um, but um, I, I, had, I had my last semester at school, we had done a field trip to San Francisco where their main office is. And that's where I met some of those alum that I stayed in touch with. And when I moved out to LA, one of them sort of messaged me and was like, hey, are you interested in this? It's not a composer gig, but it's this music editing thing, short-term con, like it's like short-term thing, but like they're looking for somebody for a little bit of work. Is that something that you might be interested in? And I was, you know, I just moved to LA. I was, and, and, and it kind of hit me from the side because I think I had one music editing class at Berkeley. It wasn't a very Everybody was talking about being a composer. It was like, that was the big thing. Everybody wanted to be a composer. Everyone wanted to write music. However, people wanted to get there. That's, that's what people were focusing on. That's what I was focused. That's what my plan was too, was to focus on. Um, but then this music, this sort of this, this little thing hit me on the side here. And um, of course I took it because I wanted some money and I needed a job and, and, and some, some, something just, I had just moved, I just moved here and that had turned into um from what was supposed to be a little a, a short contract for some uh for like this digital comic that PlayStation was doing of a, of a God of War comic where they were like we just need somebody to take the music from the game that Bear wrote and we need to sort of edit it and cut it to the digital comic version that Dark Horse Comics had done of the physical versions and um I was like that sounds pretty cool and totally not what I was thinking of was going to be doing but then that led to just all these other things of, of like, hey, like, OK, now you're here. Like you live in Sherman Oaks. We're going to be working on Call of Duty. They're over in Woodland Hills. You want to like work on that? And I was it yeah, kind of well, led to all these things that I wasn't expecting. Yeah. Cal California has a way of kind of trapping people here. I, I can <laughs> attest. Yeah. And it's my, my old my old boss always used to say that, like, you know, look for points of opportunity and um. And I've said before in the past on um on, on some on some podcasts and things too, that's like I don't really believe in like sheer luck, but I believe in people being able to put themselves having control of being able to put yourself in a position that like those sort of like those opportunities and that luck is more likely to present itself to you. And for me, that was moving here and that was staying in touch with a lot of my classmates and a lot of and, and meeting a lot of like school alum and just taking people out for coffee and stuff like that and just kind of trying to get to know as many people as possible where it's like this thing kind of hit me that I wasn't expecting but I just kind of ran with it in LA yeah if, if you live in, and yeah if you're familiar then you, then you know know like it's like things kind of just they'll, they'll unexpectedly happen if you're here long enough and if you if you stick it through that you know California like you said will trap you here and kind of like get you into the, the 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 grind of the work because it's it's just a very much like a workaholic sort of city and 
I just have to, it's uncanny how your ending thoughts of each keep leading to my next question, because I was about to ask, um, so the industry is known for crunch. Sometimes it, there's the necessity to it. There's some contract, depending on who you ask. Mm -hmm. so I'm sure you've had to work through some, like, how do you handle when like tight deadlines are coming up? Are there any sacrifices you have to make to the quality or do you just double down? Is it sleep, yeah. nights, extra coffee? What is your coping mechanism or just general strategy for that? Yeah. Stuff? I will say when I started out, it was a lot more just like, I felt like I really was having to prove myself a lot. And I felt like the only way to prove myself was to show physical like strain in terms of like, yeah, not sleeping or like staying in the studio really, really late showing that I was so pa like the only way to show that I was good at my job and really passionate was, was by crunching and by staying super late, working super hard, like long hours, not taking lunch breaks, things like that. But um, I've tried pivoting, like Bungie's really, really good at like about managing timelines and, and, and expectations and crunch. Okay. Good Mostly thing. because, I mean, a lot part because the studio has had its rough, it's, it's had its share of rough times. You can go look up articles online, right. Of like some of the notorious early halo days of development, um, how it really took a toll on the studio. Oh, um, you know, I, yeah, I, there's like I had the, no idea about that. Oh yeah. You can, you can either, there's, there's, there's public articles about this. You can go look up. Um, but like, um, you know, so it's, they've had a lot of experience and sort of the, the, the pendulum has swung both ways. Like we've worked our, we, you know, and so now they're trying to find a happy medium. And um, so, so, so now sort of have, this is like my fifth year in the industry. I'm trying to find a better balance. And I feel like Bungie enforces that and really does a good job of that. Like I rarely have to work more than 40 hours a week. You know, I do my 10 to seven oh. um, and that's, and that's pretty much it because box product game i mean box product games are kind of a different story where it's like everybody's sort of doing their best they're all working really really hard because there is this there's this light at the end of the tunnel built into the whole mechanism of like the product's going to release and that's it and then there will be a recovery period right. but on live service like a game like destiny that doesn't exist because the thing is just going endlessly right and so there's no recovery period so because there's no time to recover like that, you have to build into your whole business model. How do we do this in a sustainable way that doesn't have anyone burn out and get right. really, and really exhausted? And I'm very curious, like for live service games, especially the kinds that go on for half a decade or more, like how do you like how do you determine who gets to take a vacation at what time? And also in my experience in the industry, I've often like had noticed that sometimes I want to push a file through or an asset through, be it a, a sound file, a song, or just something that I need to continue my implementation, but I'm waiting on someone to finish the JSON file or mm. update X, blah, 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 blah. Do you find yourself like, maybe it sounds like Bungie is super well synced, but do you ever find yourself like waiting? Oh, I wish this one guy would finish this one hitbox on this one gun so I can get back. And again, I know that's not... That's a dumb example, but you know what I mean. Something no, sure. you've been held up by the process. Sure. Well, I will say that like having a really good having we have like a really good music producer and having good producers really helps mitigate that because it's like if you ever run into a situation like that, they can go talk to like that area disciplines producer too and try to get you unblocked and solve very quickly so that a lot of that responsibility doesn't fall on someone like me that's just trying to like do my work. And a, a producer's job is to help enable their team to be able to most efficiently do their work. And so, I mean, yeah, we've been very thankful that Bungie recognizes that it, how important it is to have good producers. Um, and so the issue doesn't come up as much, uh, thankfully. But um, I would say also, I mean, like, it's kind of about being, it's it's about have like, for me, it's about pre having, trying to have like a really proactive mindset rather than a reactive mindset. So if I'm in a situation okay. where like I'm blocked by something, I usually, I will jump to some, I will jump to something else. Like working in games, you have to have a very sort of fluid, pivotable mindset of like, um, you know, hey, maybe I was working on this for two hours. Um, and now I'm blocked on that. Like I got to very quickly pivot to working on something else, like on a different area of the game. Like maybe I was working on level one 
and everything was going great. And someone else checked out like a file on level one and I can't complete my work or submit it. Like I got to quickly pivot and like, oh, there's stuff to do on level three. Like, so I'll do stuff on level three. And, you know, by the time I'm done with that, maybe they'll have submitted their stuff and then I can resume on there. So it's being able to have a very fluid mindset because there's very rarely days where you're, where I'm sitting for eight hours doing the same thing. Like it's a lot of pivoting between meetings and what we would say call like individual contributor work, which is basically where you're just working in sort of a black box on like content, like in pro tools or something. Got it. And so it's being, yeah. So I would say it shows up less because of I'm trying to have adopted more of a my, mentality of that. And also mixed with like, we have really good producers. Um, so, but it's, it's, I mean, I'll, I mean, it's funny you mentioned that those things, like, you know, that example, because that example, I mean, that situation has come up several times, right. Where I'm like, I really wish this person would submit this file because I'm waiting to like do some work in wise, which, um, you know, it yeah. all stems to having, you know, really good organization and, um, a good structure t- good, good team structure, um, which thankfully we've, um, done, I, I think a pretty good job at and are still learning and building and getting better at it. Um, yeah. All right. I, I mean, I can just totally relate to that frustration sometimes when you do deal with a unfortunate blockage it's like they say if i had a nickel for every time i got pulled i got pushed aside for a json file i'd have eight to 86 nickels which is a weird amount but it's more than what you'd think you'd have totally yeah um so uh thank you so much for your time uh before we close this out do you have just any final thoughts for anyone who wants to either follow in your footsteps or is just interested in music editing or just any final thoughts you want to give to the audience of any totally. kind of yeah I mean, what I'll say is like um, the, the hard skills in terms of like getting good at Pro Tools and Wise and those kind of things are becoming more of sort of the like expectation in order to get into this kind of job. And I would say for folks that are interested in something that I do or something similar, would to try to be to focus on like one sort of more soft skill stuff, like especially if you want to work on a team, like understanding team dynamic and good communication and time management and professionalism and those kind of like soft skills, which kind of, they come with experience and time. So it's obviously like, you can't just read a book and then like the lights just all turn on in your head and you're like, aha, like, you know, obviously that comes with some time, but also one thing that I read that I recommend to folks that are interested in just game audio in general is to become, is to find something you're really, really passionate about and be able to vocalize and talk about it. So like, if it's game music, you know, find what it, like whatever your favorite games are, your game music are, like play through the game with just the music on, understand what is just happening with the music, and then be able to vocalize that or, you know, express your passion about that to, to people. Because passion, I think, is one of those things that is very easy to see and recognize, and it's very hard to put down on paper. And so I think it's something that will help people stand out if they can find ways to show that they're passionate about something, whether that's like making a YouTube video or writing a blog or, you know, doing interviews with people or like, like things like, you know, like that, like it's, it's that, that's the kind of thing that sort of shows shows that extra step of passion that I think we're in a phase now of the industry where like a lot of the technical stuff, it's kind of almost like expected. It's kind of, it's no longer the, like the nice to haves. It's sort of like, if you want a job, like a job in this sort of field, the competition's only getting more. So how do you help make yourself stand out? To me, I think it's, it's, it's about trying to like really double down on, on you as a person and like show your passion, your motivation. And cause like, obviously having a demo reel, if you're a composer or a sound designer, the technical chops, those are like all things that are, you know, you need to have, but those are kind of the, like, you're going to be competing with everybody else that also has those things. Right. And right. so what's going to make you stand out that's a little that will help get you through to that interview that, you know, people might see and want to talk to you more about that they can't really just they can't do on paper. And I feel like and I feel like that, you know, being passionate is one of those things that's like very subjective and um, it's it's so person based that it leads itself well to just people wanting to be interested in what you have to say. Um so that's my ramble. That's my long-winded way of, um, you know, of, of closing words. Um, but also, you know, 
take it slow. Nothing like I think, you know, we, we have this mentality too that like everything has to happen so fast, especially in today's society with social media. And I'm not going to go on a high horse about all that. But it's really, I feel, I mean, I feel it too. It's like, it's really easy to fall into this thing of like, if it's not happening now, like I'm very impatient and I want to kind of like, I want things to be happening, but life is kind of a slow burn and just sort of enjoy it. It's not a straight line. It's all over the place. Right. So. All right. Um. Yeah. Very sound, very wise advice. Wise with two W's. How about that? <laughs> all right. right on, dude. Uh, Adam, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, likewise, Noah. Thanks for having me. And um, I wish you and I wish everybody uh, the best and, and, and good luck in the future. All right. See you, everybody.